I'm honored to be here today with Pastor Mashazi, and he is from South Africa. He was brought into the ministry around 1980 and started education in 81, started to serve right during a time when there was war in his country. Mm -hmm. There was a major genocide during the time where he was beginning the ministry, and he's got a lot of story to tell in the 80s, mm -hmm. and he will be able to help you understand from his background in Zimbabwe that he was studying as a pastor, he was led to serve for several years and on and off a few times. He recently came from America where he's been able to uh, enter into um, a really difficult time in his life where his wife ended up being ill. And then when they went back to South Africa, she lost her life at the end of 2022. Is that right? Yes. And yes. Yes. Master. Yes. Okay. So uh, he's going to tell his story, having been through some of the videos that I've uh, been able to share online as a result of one of his friends, one of his uh, personal friends, I suppose, his name is Sonny. And he, Sonny contacted me and said, this pastor has accepted the truth about God in just a very short time. And so you, you might want to talk to him. And so I reached out and Pastor Machazi is here and we're going to hear a little bit about from him. So please tell us your story pastor of what it was that you went through coming into education and starting your ministry, the time and era. You had been serving in the military as well before that. So give us a little bit of history. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Mesa. Thank you for inviting me here. And thanks to our viewers. Um, like um, Pastor Mesa, I said, my name is Pastor Machazi. My first name is Dumiso. I am a Zulu by origin. Dumiso means if you are counting praises, pray if you are praising, and just one praise. Hmm. My Chazi, of course, is a long um, warrior name. We are as Zulus. If you know anything about Zulus or warriors, I'm actually um, uh, maybe six, seven generations ago. My my grandfather was a brother to the renowned King Chaga Zulu hmm. from the same family by the same father. Um, but well, that's the story for another day. It's not for this forum. Right. Um, so I was born 64 years ago, 1959, just in the month of October. And I was born in Ikando, Zimbabwe. This is where I grew up and did my elementary education and high school education. This is also where I went to college. But before you could go to college, you were required by law to first spend a year uh, doing what they called national service. That was before Zimbabwe got its independence. We had um, a, come, a government run by um, a guy called Ian Smith, who was actually a, a rebel against the British Kingdom or British Empire or British uh, uh, government. Mm -hmm. He declared what was called UDI, which meant a neutral declaration of independence. Um, and so he wanted to make Zimbabwe a, a, a country governed by white settlers there with um, a neat picking of Africans that way would fit into his program. But then that didn't really sit very well with the majority of the black people. So a whole war of liberation was fought, which was concluded in 1980, but it was not concluded in a very amicable way. There was still some misunderstanding between the groups that were fighting for independence. And so in 1980, while I was serving my military, my my military, um, my what they called national service, it was also time of for independence. So the, there wasn't no there was no easy way of making a clear cut from the previous regime to the new one. So even though the national service belonged to the old regime, we were still required to serve. While I was serving national service for the a program for the old regime, the the new regime was doing genocide against a section of the population from which I actually derived. Hmm. And um, the people, it's, it's um, suspected that between 20 to 40,000 people were killed in cold blood for nothing else except that they, they spoke a certain language. Okay. And um, that's the language I speak, the, the version of Zulu that is spoken in Zimbabwe. Of hey, course, would, Zulu is spoken. Would yes. you mind just... Uh maybe quoting a Bible verse for us, maybe John 3.16 in your language, just to be able to hear it for those that are online. Why not? Why not? <laughs> so you'd say, Utiko, 
thanda ilizwe kangaga wazi wanigela ngindota na yake ezelwe yotwa kuba bonke abakholwa yo bangapupi kodwa ababe nokuphila omuna phakathi amen thank you <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's the word of language of course yes so i like uh, pastor Mesa was saying during my training there was already this genocide going on and uh, like i said many people were killed like I, I estimates range from 20 to 40000 the catholic priest commission uh, tried their best to document the incident so even though the government has never openly agreed that they did it there is so much evidence that was combined co compiled by the catholic uh, commission for peace uh, P pastors commission that compiled the data from eyewitnesses even showing pictures of where people were killed and buried in in shallow graves mm. some people were thrown into mines some people were thrown into tanks of uh, acids and they were bent never to see to be seen i have relatives who died like that either wow. in the mines or bent up Mm -hmm. Some of them disappeared to this day. We do not know what happened. I know that um, it traumatized people in my community. I know that my grandmother's mother, who was actually very lucid up till that time, died very confused because my father's cousin, who was the son of her elder son, is one of those people who disappeared like that. I mm -hmm. could go on and on. It was um, It was a horror to actually, I know that there was a day during that process when my house as a pastor was targeted wow. and my name would be burnt and probably I'd be arrested or killed, I don't know. But then my name, and it was on the assumption that since I was not being seen participating in the political party that was ruling, that means I belong to the opposite party. But my neighbors knew that I didn't. So all they could do, the best they could do was to at least try and say, save my uh, property. Mm -hmm. So they took all my property into their homes uh, so that in the event that people came to destroy my house and burn it up and whatever, at least they'll just burn an empty house. Fortunately, wow. that night, when they were turning into the coup de sac to where I lived, the order was given by central government to arrest the, the rioters who were, who were killing and burning houses and, and all that stuff. So that is how my house was saved. And of course, I, had, I remember praying, said, Lord, look, I'm a sinner. If it was me being killed, it would be okay. But this house has stood here for years mm -hmm. to house ministers. Why must you let it be burned out? I don't, I don't get it. So if it was just me, well, I'm a sinner, so it's okay. But why the house? Yeah, so yeah, well, God, right. saved, God saved the house. Amen. And um, well, God saved my life too. So <laughs> yeah. I can tell the story. So it was... Um, so yeah, Zimbabwe is one of those trouble places like that around ethnicity because largely there are two major ethnic groups. And so it's easy to build animosity unlike countries where there are many ethnic groups. And I think um, the global powers have not helped because global powers have taken sides in, the, in those misunderstandings. I think global powers took this position like the country of the UK because it was for our former colony. If the United Kingdom took a stand I think the problem will be solved. Okay. But the United Kingdom is not taking a stand. Oh. So now after that time, you were you were already in the ministry. How long did you continue pastoring and where? Had you been transferred a few places? Tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Yes. I so I was trained uh, at our historic college. Most people know about Solusi College, which became Solusi University after independence. That's where I trained. We initially, our degrees were coming from Andrews University, so we were accredited by, by, accredited by Andrews University. But yeah. subsequently, the national government gave us our own charter, so you get your degree from Solusi. It is recognized as a private university in Zimbabwe. So after I finished my diploma, I was posted to a um, part in Zimbabwe called Gweru. It's in the middle of the country. I passed that there for two years. Then I went back to Solusi to finish my degree. And after that, I went back to Gweru for um, a short period before I was transferred to the city of Bulawayo, which is the second largest city in Zimbabwe, excuse me. And then after I was in Bulawayo for two, three years, I got accepted at Loma Linda, and I traveled to Loma Linda to do my master's in public health. Yeah. 
intended to do education, but ended up doing biostatistics and epidemiology. So I graduated and worked in the US for a short time before coming back again to Zimbabwe now to be part of the management of Solus University, my alma mater. Wow. And I was responsible for there for development and public relations for some years. And then I moved from there to a public university for a short stint uh, where they had opened a medical school and they wanted a public health component in the degree program. So I worked there for a while. Then the economy of the country collapsed. That's when I moved to South Africa and was doing private consultancies uh, for a while, came back, worked for government as a consultant managing policy and research. Because remember, my public health degree was in public health, biostatistics and research. Mm -hmm. And then I returned to South Africa um, and subsequently came back into the ministry, served in a few districts. So in Zim, I worked probably in uh, two, well, I can say two, yeah, three districts. Then in South Africa, I also worked in two districts until 2018 when uh, the Trans Orange Conference in Johannesburg, which is uh, somewhere in Johannesburg, um, had gone through a split for political reasons. That conference was looking forward to coming back together. And so being a foreigner, I was the easiest person to drop out of the, of the conference in the, pro in the process of their amalgamation, which unfortunately didn't happen. But anyway, the following year, I decided to go back to the US in the same Loma Linda area. And I was part of um, one small church up in the, in the high desert. Okay. Uh, called, yeah, for the time I was there before my wife fell ill. My wife had remained and were arranging for her and the children to come and join me. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be so. Um, um, she fell ill because while she was here in South Africa, she decided she wanted to do a course in medical missionary training which required her to go, I uh, leave the, whole, uh, the older kids with, uh, the younger kids with the older kids and go and spend some time in a training center in the Wazulu Natal area. But the site was a very damp area. It was always raining. And she decided she wanted to go there even though the facility was not completed and she was living in a, t in a tent. Okay. So there would always be moisture and the moisture caused molds and the molds were poisonous and they caused infection. Many, many learners were sick there. Mm. She also caught an infection, but unfortunately has, was terminal a year later in 2022 in November. So we buried her on the 17th of November last year. You were married for 10 years. You have twins yes. right now that are six years old. And last year, your twins at five years old and yourself lost their mother and your your wife and it's just a tragedy that you went through that and uh it is it we is. are well, sorry thank you. yes thank, thank you. you for that thank you for the pastor mess but look it's a war right it is it is i i don't treat the devil nice i don't expect him to treat me nice either <laughs> you're right that i i appreciate <laughs> that now you were saying yeah. that uh, a little while ago you were saying that um, you have lost family before, you know, mother and father, but losing a wife is a whole nother level. And especially yes, looking at your two twin sons, I mean, that would just be really yes. very difficult. So our hearts, our hearts are going out for you, and we pray that Thank God you. will continue to bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that. Yeah. So yes, now, that. in the midst of all this trial, a very educated person as yourself, having been to Loma Linda, having been to the colleges in Zimbabwe and South Africa, serving in the, the church for many years. What was it like when, in the midst of losing your wife and going through all of this, you learned about God in a different way? Tell us about that. I must admit that initially I thought it was just wishful thinking. There is um, nothing wrong with the um, Trinity message. It talks about the uh, well, I always, I hardly say Trinity anyway. I always picked up from the writings of Ellen White, and when I realized that the word Trinity created controversy, I'll always mm -hmm. talk about the Godhead. Yes, me too. But yeah, so it it I, I got away with that. I didn't have to argue with Trinitarian issues. Well, then being exposed to this, 
caused me to have to ask questions I'd never asked before. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I remember one person in, in our prayer group saying to me, but I mean, what, what harm does it, what, time, what harm does it make to talk about the Trinity? So I said to him, well, look, what harm does it make to talk about Sunday as a sacred day when it is not? I mean, it's always bad to, to, to harbor or keep a, or portray or teach a false doctrine. Right. It uh, doesn't present God well. Mm -hmm. it, it's uh, to say God said to keep the Sunday holy when he didn't is not true. So it does a lot of harm. It's, um, it's taking God's name in vain. And um, of course, James tells us that when you break one commandment, commandment you have broken them all. So right. you, you cannot be lax about actions that um, take God's name for granted, you want you want to protect the name name of God in particular. That's so right. I mean, the commandments are commandments, but this is really who God is. That's right. And how do you wink? How do you wink on it? You yeah. can't wink it. You can't wink it off. Yeah. I have said many times. In fact, just a few days ago, I was sitting with another pastor in the Adventist Church, and we were we were sitting together discussing this topic. Very kind, very mm -hmm. uh, cordial conversation, but. One of the things he asked was that very same question. Why is this important? And I said, you know, if you go back 2,000 years ago, the Israelites, they had the right day, but the wrong God. And he goes, and, and I said, today it's the same thing. We have the right day and the wrong God. He says, what do you mean the wrong God? And I said, well, the Trinity, it's the wrong God. And he was, he kind of like thought, thought for a second. He hadn't put that in his head yet, but that was a big deal to him. And so, uh, what was it like for you to go through this? I mean, you're you're telling us a little bit more, but you're an educated man. You should have known these things before, right? Well, I, I remember listening to your um, testimony. I think you are a pretty educated man too. You you what I think what happens with us is that there are so many things right about Adventism already. Yes. And already you are fighting with all these brothers and sisters who are worshiping on Sunday. So you tend to then take Adventist things to be sacrosanct and um, you don't want to argue with everything. Mm -hmm. And you 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 accept what the brethren are saying. And then someday you think about it for yourself and you say, wait a minute, maybe I should think again. Amen. And um so I don't I think um maybe education is overrated. <laughs> maybe education is overrated. I think we all have um our own um well one of the things I learned in my graduate education is the whole concept of um, systems theory. And in systems theory, one of the things what, which was strongly negated was the idea of objectivity, that we all have, um, we, we actually agree to be subjective together and we call it objectivity, but it really is a form of subjectivity. And I think when you are relating to people that you agree with on so many things, it's hard to want to mark everything they say. Some things you give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And accept them without really putting through them through the rigor, you have put a lot of things through. And then you are embarrassed to realize that, you know what? You probably uh, swallowed more than you could chew. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So now you said you had gone through the testimony video and you had seen some of the things maybe from a different perspective. Um, yes. what, what did that lead you to do? You went through the five videos of the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and the Trinity questions, right? Five Trinity questions, yes, I okay, did. So tell me about the Father. Have you seen the Father the way that uh, you you started to see it after you realized the Trinity is not in the Bible? I think there was very little that shifted in my mind about the Father. Okay. I think my Father picture was pretty solid. Um, I think, sorry, I'll have to move on. So... Um, I always then assumed to, to, you know, how your mind wants to maintain equilibrium. I then always maintained that the sunness of Jesus Christ happened before the world was founded, but because of the promised incarnation. I didn't um, visualize the idea that he was begotten back then. Mm -hmm. I always integrated in my mind by saying his sunness happened during the incarnation. I always thought that he was intrinsically um, equal with the Father. Right. And so it had been now having to accept the mystery of uh, his being begotten 
and I probably send you a few a few statements and questions about that whole idea of being begotten. How does that work? Mm -hmm. And I remember you and I interacting of the fact that well, you know, Eve was begotten from Adam, yes. and um, it's not something we can always logically explain. Um, and so maybe the the so what for me the mystery of the God it was around the Trinity. But I think as I've interacted with the information you've shared with me, I realize that the mystery of the iniquity, uh, the Trinity is probably more complex than the incarnation. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. It, it's definitely more complex because everybody you speak with has a different understanding of that humanistic ideology. It's not something you can just read about in the Bible that it describes what the Trinity is. It's, it's something that's human made. So yes. for you, for you, it was the, really the Son of God being begotten, like John yes. 16 that you quoted earlier, when you yes. said, for God so loved the world in Zulu language, you know, yes. that he gave his only begotten Son. You as an African, you know what a son is. A son is somebody who yes, came from the Father, right? Yeah. No. So yeah. Uh, that when, I, when I'm in Africa, I love asking that question. How many of you are fathers? And, you know, the, yes. the raise their hand. You know, it's, a yeah. <laughs> it's a very important thing. And then I'll say, well, yeah. how many of you are younger than your sons? And they'll look at each other like, what? <laughs> what? Does make any sense? <laughs> how many are the same age as your sons? And they're like, wait, what? What is he talking about? That doesn't make yeah. any sense to a... To a no, it doesn't. Yeah, you know? it doesn't make sense. And mm. so uh, when, when we're in Christianity, somehow it makes sense that the father and the son are the same age. And then... Yes. And then, you know, one thing that has bothered me, Pastor, is that people here in this state so often will say, well, you know, it's God. And I used to as well as a pastor uh, yes. for many years. It's God. And, and so he's so much bigger and broader than we are as humans. He's got to use language that we can understand as humans. Yes. So that, yes. And, I'm, and now, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, OK, God is the creator of language. But he's not mm -hmm. intelligent enough to use the proper language to help us understand you know? it won't actually deceive mm -hmm. us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. uh, that's that's just another thought that comes to my head is is God is yes. than that. He should be able to yes. tell us exactly what we want yes. us, wants us to know. That is true. What about the yeah. Holy Spirit? Have you have you learned much about the Holy Spirit uh, through those questions that came? I, I, I have. I have, and I was actually hoping you and I would uh, you you would actually elucidate. The idea, I think I've gotten the idea that it is the spirit of the father and it is the spirit of the son. Mm -hmm. What I, I, I'm i still uh, battling with is the timelines that are created in the book of John. When Jesus says it is expedient that I go, because if I don't go, he won't come. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to say, doesn't that say it's another person? So I haven't, out of all the texts that you sent and out of all the uh, messages I've sent, I have not had a clear response. I think I've had the idea that that always, um, I guess, wrestled my spirit was the idea of um, grieving of the Holy Spirit. Okay. But then you you gave a number of tracks of people breathe, grieving, their spirits grieving. And then I realized, well, yeah, that the grieving element itself is not enough to mm -hmm. make him a unique person. You could still be the spirit of God grieving, like the spirit of all these other people that grieve that we have in our uh, in our language and in our in our in our conversation and in our parlance. So uh, at the bottom, at the end of it all, it doesn't have to be another person because of grieving. Right. What I'm I'm still processing, and I'm hoping you, as we converse here, you can add more light onto is then why does Jesus say he has got to come? Let I need to go so that he can come, and then that whole event in the um, in the book of Acts chapter two. I mean, what is going on there? Yeah. I was saying Jesus went and came back. What, what, what's going on there? Okay. I yeah. think that is the place. That's the place where I'm saying all the conversations that I've had with the videos, the, the listening, the reviewing, the reading of the spirit prophecy in preparation of this interview. I have not had anything that really addresses those two matters clearly. And maybe you can help me there. I don't yeah. want to pretend I understood that because I didn't understand. No, that. no. I'm glad you're being honest and, and very open here. Um, so... That is something that I have considered quite a bit in the past, is, and I continue to think about that because it's such a beautiful thought. So here's mm -hmm. here's the thing. When Adam mm -hmm. sinned, how mm -hmm. was he forgiven? He was forgiven 
by the blood of the lamb, right? Yes. The problem was the lamb had not come yet. The lamb was still right. promised 4,000 years in the future. Right. And so he was forgiven by faith. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now, how was he able to be clothed with that garment of the lamb? Because the lamb had not come yet. How was okay. he cleansed and, and given righteousness or justification by faith? That's not an experience that had ever happened before. He had no. said, and, and here he was. So that was something also that was coming by faith, right? True. So Adam was forgiven, and he was clothed with the righteousness of Christ by faith. And everybody after that, no. he was, Abraham was, Moses. 4,000 years. Yeah. 4,000 4, years, years of people were, were clothed by faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so... Yes. Jesus was living on this earth, actually building that character, as Sister White says, that had not one single thread of human devising. It was woven like, like gold through the Looms garment, the right? Yeah, the loom mm -hmm. of heaven, right? And so mm -hmm. you have this, this experience that Christ was going through. And he was saying that when he, the spirit of truth, is come, Mm -hmm. which I will send from the Father, right? The Father will send mm -hmm. in my name. You can get that. My mm -hmm. question is mm -hmm. to the Trinitarian, how could the Spirit be sent? I thought the Spirit was everywhere. Mm -hmm. like, how, how is it true that Christ had to leave first and then the Spirit comes? Wait a minute. We're talking about Actually, that, Those are my questions. Those are my right. questions. Right. So yes. these, these are the things that I think will hopefully be helpful. If Jesus Christ was building that character that he would now extend to Adam by faith and Abraham, and then you also by faith, 2000 mm -hmm. years later, mm -hmm. when he would be able to fulfill that commission, which his father had given him to do, mm -hmm. what are my words above everything in the face of this planet? And you will mm -hmm. be on my, my side the entire time. You will, you will have kept faithful to my kingdom. You would never have mm -hmm. stepped into the kingdom of Satan. Christ mm -hmm. did it every single day. So yes, when he was able to ascend and offer himself as the lamb without spot, without blemish to the father, then it was that the father could actually send the spirit. Now, question, how do you send the spirit? Is it a disembodied soul that could be just sent down like rain or water or anything like that? Well, yeah. no, no, it's not. Um, see, the Bible says that the clouds are the ones that have rain, right? The clouds have mm -hmm. rain. And we're to pray mm -hmm. for the Lord to send rain at the time of the latter rain. Well, when you're praying for rain, yes. you're also praying for clouds. The Bible says mm -hmm. clouds are the angels, okay? Mm -hmm. the angels have rain. They've been given rain. They've been given the opportunity to have that blessed spirit. And they are the ones that ascend and descend upon the ladder, right? The ladder is Jesus Christ. Right. The is there. Mm -hmm. And so on the day of Pentecost, what happened was, the angels came down with the sound of the rushing mighty wind, which was their wings. When they stopped, the wind ceased, and they showed up as they are. If you go to Hebrews 1, verse 7, and also Psalm 104, verse 3 or 4, it says mm -hmm. that Jesus, uh, sorry, that God the Father has made his angels to be, uh, his ministers to be flames of fire. And mm -hmm. so when Jesus was anointed in heaven, it says in Hebrews 1, verses 8 and 9, that, you know, your throne, O God, is an everlasting throne. The scepter of your kingdom, or right, the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And it says, um, your God has anointed you with oil above your fellows. Well, Christ is the one that's being talked about that was anointed. The fellows mm -hmm. are the angels. So the, mm -hmm. the son was anointed. The angels were anointed because the angels are like the priests in the sanctuary, right? So you have the Father, mm -hmm. which is the Most High, you have the High Priest, which is Jesus Christ, and you have all the ministers, which are the priests, which are the angels. And those okay. are the ones that are ministering back and forth between uh, heaven and earth. That's why the angels have the brazen feet, just like Christ has the brazen feet in Revelation 1. Uh, Ezekiel 1, the angels have brazen feet. And so they're going back and forth between the brazen outer court and the golden holy place, right? That's what the angels are doing. That's why they have brazen feet. And so... Um, you have that idea of them going up and down on the ladder. They're the ones that are bringing the spirit. Those are the ones, the angels are the ones that were sent. So when he, the spirit of truth is come, which I will send from the father, I'm putting two verses together, but when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. You see the, the people in the new Testament 
all through the book of Acts. They were guided by the holy angels, the ministers that were God's ministers going from heaven to earth. They're actually called the, I don't know how to say it in the Greek, but they're basically the deacons. And they're the ones that fulfill the, um, the role, the public ministry of Christ. The angels are the ones that do that. So really, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, it's when the angels are able to bring the actual fulfilled spirit of Christ. Not the one that's just promised. It's the one that's now actually done by the Son of God. Now, that doesn't make it any more powerful. Because by faith, you can have a belief in God's promise that is just as powerful as the actual fulfillment. So it's not like the people in the Old Testament had a better experience as a Christian compared or a lesser experience as a Christian compared to the people in the New Testament. New Testament. Because that would be unfair. At the judgment, we'd be able to say, now, God, that's not fair. Those people in the New Testament, they had a better experience than I did in the Old Testament, and that's why I'm not saved. No, 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 not at all. You can have the same spirit by faith as you have the same spirit that it has actually been completed. And so in the New and Old Testament, you have the same experience. It's always about Christ. In, in, fact, in fact, in fact, Pastor Dan, yeah. um, one of the things that as a New Testament believer and being uh, raised in this Trinitarian worldview, you actually, um, the role of angels is diminished completely. Completely. Absolutely. Yeah, completely. You really are saying, so what are the angels doing? Right. And that's part of the problem. Yeah. That's part of the problem is we've taken God, the Holy Spirit, and we put it in the place of God's ministers. Yes. So there's really no need for the angels if God, the Holy Spirit. No, there's, it's hard as an Adventist to talk about angels. What do you say they did? What are they doing? <laughs> right, right. Nothing. But, you know, so you see, when Jesus Christ was in the midst of the most difficult temptation he had ever faced. Satan was personally in front of Christ in the wilderness of temptation. Who did yes. God send? But send an angel. That's right. Now, at the very end of Christ's ministry, three and a half years later, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Same he was thing. at the point of giving up. He was saying, I do not want to do part. this. Not my will, but mm -hmm. yours. God sent an angel to his son. And True. so... If we are walking in this world just like Christ walked in the world, when we're stressed with temptation or we're ready to give up, what is God going to send to us? The same See, thing. We, we always say the Holy Spirit. Yes. But we, we, don't, we, we don't see that related to angels. Right. In a Trinitarian worldview, it's the Holy Spirit, whatever that means. Yeah. And so the angels are not the Holy Spirit. The angels are full of the Holy Spirit. And that's how the, the Spirit is brought to us is through people. Like, for example, if you in uh, South Africa, you're looking mm -hmm. at your two sons, they've lost their, their mother just a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. You could say to them, you know what, be comforted, and you could walk away. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of father is that? That's, See, not, that's not parenting. That's not no. parenting. You're going to be the comforter for your kids. You're going to put your arms around them, and you're going to tell them of how course. much you love them, how much they matter yes. to this world. Yes. And stuff. Yes. How much yes. the, the mother loved them and wished you wish she could still be there. You're going to be that comforter. You're not just going to say, "Holy yes. Spirit, bless them," you know. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So the the way that we have uh, become so far removed from what God is actually doing through His agents is beyond me and it's because of the trinitarian doctrine but you know so uh, it's really the angelic ministry that brings to us the spirit of god and we ought to study as sister white says we as ministers should know and tell people about the minister the uh, ministering angels to as many people as we can influence and so okay. that's it's pretty powerful so i that, think i i think without a doubt i'm guilty there <laughs> oh me too absolutely yeah all I will speak about will be the Holy Spirit. Right. And so, but but now, um, going through your question and, and giving just a little answer to your question, and we'll be able to study mm -hmm. that further. Now you can mm -hmm. start seeing, wait a minute, when we have the angelic ministry going up and down on that ladder, that ladder, according to uh -huh. John 1, verse 51, is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Wow, we have something there that's it's a co-working together with the agents of heaven. So uh, yes. now all of a sudden you're on a team that's really powerful. And uh, that. 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Now, well, look, um, with with with, um, with our concocted, probably unrealistic view of the Holy Spirit, I don't think we felt less powerful. It's just that it wasn't really based on realism. There was no. It ignored everything else that God has revealed about Himself and how He works and all His agents, like you're saying. Uh, the the Trinitarian doctrine just makes it look like God just needs nobody but His threesomeness, whatever that is. Right. He doesn't need anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it actually begs a question: So why did He make angels? Right. You know why, why create angels then? Yeah. I was going through that years ago. I was on my morning walk and I was I was just praying to God, saying, "Lord, why is it that you're using angels? I don't understand. Like like I know that they're all over the Bible. I'm seeing it, but why?" And mm -hmm. I believe it was my angel that said to me, "Because God needs witnesses." Hmm. And I was like, "What?" Interesting. I, I was, okay. I was actually laughing and and just praising God out loud. There. You know? in, uh, Southern California uh, in your walk, yeah. <laughs> on my walk, because I thought that's exactly what it is. See, in the yes. judgment, in the judgment, if God the Holy uh -huh. Spirit is doing everything without being seen or heard, mm -hmm. nobody knew mm -hmm. where he was and what he was doing, mm -hmm. Satan would be able to say, That's not fair. I don't have that, and you have one people with something that I didn't have access to. That's not fair. And so now when you know, the original Great Controversy written in 1858 was titled The Great Controversy Between Christ and His Angels and Satan and His Angels. That was the full title. Yeah. The mm -hmm. Great Controversy Between Christ and His Angels and Satan and His Angels. Now, when you have that in the idea, you realize like, okay, Christ is using angels. Satan's using angels. You're right in the middle and you're going to be influenced by good or evil the exact same way. Mm -hmm. So in the judgment, mm -hmm. it's fair. It's completely fair. So Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Sure. Now, so you went through the questions on the Trinity. What what did that do to you? Did that help you realize, like, wow, the Trinity is true, or the Trinity <laughs> comes from a very strange place? Um. It. it the, look. Um. I'm. I'm not a, a, a. I wasn't born yesterday. I mean, I've been thinking in in the Trinitarian way. Uh, for the my I was baptized in, in 1977 okay so I've been my grandfather was an Adventist pastor mm -hmm. uh, in fact my he, his father-in-law who was a chief was the first one who was introduced to Adventism by a, a, an evangelist okay and he was not he didn't become an Adventist but he had seven wives mm -hmm. so he, he he is the one who instructed them that next week you are all start. We are going to start going to church on Saturday, having been convinced by this uh, Seventh Day Adventist. So Adventism has been a way of life in my family, goodness, for quite a number of maybe four, five generations, if not six. Okay. So, um, unlike uh, many African young people, I didn't grow up in a family where people worshipped ancestral spirits. Okay. In fact, I know that my father's youngest brother left the church in his adultness and became involved with different things, including uh, ancestral worship and consulting spirits. Uh, he's the only surviving. My, my grandfather had 11 children. Uh, mm -hmm. His first wife had six children and she died. And then he married again and he had five children. So the, my in my father's family, there were 11 children who survived to adulthood. Wow. Who died in infancy. Um, so Adventism has always been how we think. So this uncle of mine, I'm, I'm bringing this case up because, so after spending maybe two, three years my, with this uncle, young, my father's young brother, dabbling in the world of spirits, he comes back and he says, you know what? My spirits are serving the Adventism. <laughs> that is my spirits. I can't do the traditional African spirits. I don't know anything about them. And, he, and he's a very, what's the word? He's a very, um, what's the word? He's you know, he's a very, um, somebody who questions a lot. Okay. I'll think of the word. Yeah, so he he said he can't have some uh, spiritual medium telling him about his spirits because that guy spiritually comes from another place which he doesn't come from. Right. So his spirit mediums is Adventism. So he'll rather copy it. So without anyone going to preach to him, he just came back to church, got rebaptized, and is now back in the church. Wow. So I'm saying, look, 
Adventism has been a way of life in my family for a long time. And therefore, um, dealing with the um, issues, Trinitarian, um, I guess, like you're saying, 1980, I think the shift wasn't obvious because there was always the talk of the, the Godhead. Yeah. And we always knew that there was the father and there was the son. And my grandfather being a pap preacher, I, I always heard him growing up when I was growing up saying, I baptize you in the name of the father, the son and the Holy Spirit. So those were assumed things. It only took getting this uh, awareness from you, but saying, well, the, I'm a student of Greek. Saying in the name of doesn't actually mean somebody's name. It actually means somebody's title. Yeah. It's um, it's a titular thing. It's not a, a normative thing as such. So it's actually the authority of mm -hmm. the, that those people. So why am I thinking that in this case it actually means uh, identities more than authorities? You understand? Yeah. So yeah. that that was something I had to process on my own, uh, borrowing from my Greek knowledge. And now for the first time saying, okay, as much, and I have baptized people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for many yeah. years. Yeah. So it, yeah, go ahead. And, and it's it's a, it's a fine to do that. I, I have no problem with that as long as we understand that it's Jesus that brings us to the Father and it's Jesus that baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible. Yes. But here's yes. something really interesting about that verse. Uh, Sister White used it thousands of times, right? And so mm -hmm. what we have is the, the authority or the name of the father. Now, the father is the title of the leader in the family. Yes. And it says in the name or authority of the son. Well, the son is the one subservient to the leader in the family. And then right. you have in the name of the Holy Ghost, which is another name for the family. Those are the agents that God uses in the ministry that he, as the father and his son, have in this family. So really, mm -hmm. when you're baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, you're, you're inviting people into the family. And you know, like G Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, God sent his son. Verse 5 mm -hmm. says it was so that we could be adopted into the family. Verse 6 says God sent the spirit of his son. And so the Father and his son, the spirit of his son, and you being adopted, that's the whole family, including the yes. ministry of angels. And so that's, that's the yes. Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is... The Holy Ghost mm -hmm. is including everybody in the family that has the spirit of the Father and or the Son. And so, mm -hmm. uh, to me, it just makes good sense now that we have a family that's being talked about, not the name Father, the name Son, and the name Holy Ghost. It just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yes, and, and you, you see that the challenge is that, yeah, the, the Trinitarian perception, it does really skew you up, and, and, and you, you really don't want to you feel awkward to accept the fact that um, heaven is is run by family, right? <laughs> because the Trinitarian worldview doesn't sh allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. Literally, it doesn't allow you to do that. Three co-equals is not a family. <laughs> no, <laughs> my it's son not. is not equal to me, and nope. he would not say that he's equal to me either. No, no you wouldn't. Like Neither. That, yeah, that mm -hmm. would be strange. In Africa, mm -hmm. I know that's not true. They would call you no, it's not. right? Mm -hmm. Mze, because... No, it's not. It's <laughs> not. What, 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 what is Jesus saying then when he suggests equality between them? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah so they both have the same authority. Like, for example, mm -hmm. when Jesus says, I and my Father are one in John chapter 10, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. go just a couple verses before that, he says, no man can pluck anyone out of my Father's hand. And then he says, yes. no man can pluck anyone out of my hand. I and the yes. Father are one. Okay. So it's the abilities that the Father and the Son have because the Father okay. has gifted the Son with those abilities. Yes, he has. So like that's why he said, all power has been given unto me because all power was given unto him. <laughs> Not that he yes. certainly had all power ever since eternity passed. Yes. It was something that was gifted to him. So... Same thing with life, as it says in John uh, 5, verse 26. And so, yes, that's why and how they're equal. The Son overcame and is now set on the Father's throne, and they are both mm -hmm. Lord of hosts. By the way, mm -hmm. the Israelites were considered hosts. And so the mm -hmm. angels are the hosts, the Israelites are the hosts. If we are subservient to the Father and his Son, 
we're part of those hosts that they are Lord of. Amen? Okay. Okay. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So now, talking about this with you, you had said, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I want to do this interview with you. And I said, well, you know, mm -hmm. this is going to get you into some trouble. And you said, I'm very aware yes. of that. Do you mind yes. explaining some more of that? What do you mean you're aware of this? Um, look, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, my, I think my problem is that I'm a very controversial person, almost naturally, because I ask questions that <laughs> are very uncomfortable <laughs> to myself and to whoever interacts with me. For instance, one of the things that I have questioned is our, um, our financial policy as a church. That why are we basing our financial policy, which then becomes a doctrine, on what a prophet wrote, Malachi. Mm -hmm. So I was driven then to go and read Deuteronomy. And when I was reading, reading Deuteronomy, I realized that tithes and offerings are presented much more differently than we present them when we, when we skim the surface of what the prophets say. Mm -hmm. So when you ask questions like that, when, when you ask questions about money, you know you are putting yourself in trouble yeah. because money is <laughs> money is so critical to any organization on this earth and uh, our church is no exception mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm I'm saying to to myself that while ministers well I'm saying to myself and my church public that while ministers need to be paid by tithing I don't think there's a biblical mandate that says tithing should only benefit ministers mm -hmm. because ministry does not happen in the minister's life. Ministry happens in the local church. And if the local church doesn't have access to tithe, how does the local church then do ministry as effectively as it should? Aren't we then just looking forward to paying this uh, executive, this rather, this thing we have set up rather than doing God's work? Mm -hmm. And uh, why should, um, and in Africa, it's really glaring. I don't know about, well, I, I mean, I've lived in, in the US as well. But in Africa, we find that a church that is returning a, a significant amount of time has no resources at all in the local church. Right, right. Nothing at all. So the church is living in a community and it has no witness. Nobody feels the church. It might as well be closed down and nobody would notice the difference. There's something interesting where I've done some study on the tithe as well. And mm -hmm. what Sister White says about third world countries, <clears throat> not saying that mm -hmm. uh, South Africa is a third world country, though there are areas it is. in it's that. Okay. It is. It is. It is. is. Okay. I didn't know. It realize. is. Yeah. I thought it was maybe second. Yeah. Um, so, what you have is in those kind of countries, Sister White says that the tithe can be used for buildings, whereas here in America and Australia, she said it cannot. And so, um, that's an interesting thought that maybe you hadn't seen before, but. Um, no, I didn't see that thought in part. I mean, I, re I remember. When churches were being planted, even in the U.S., the tithe and the offerings were used for everything. In fact, in the initial stages, I remember we were discussing this when we were talking about the Black American work, that when you are planting a church and money is being sent to the coffers, it doesn't allow for that church to actually gel together. So some of the money needs to be kept in the local church for a while, while the church is actually getting in shape. So... The, and yet in Africa, that is never even allowed. As soon as the church comes together and it's at a branch, Sabbath school branch level, the, the conference is already demanding tithes and offerings from that group. Yeah. And um, it makes for a very slow development mm -hmm. of that group to the point where they are ready to actually get into the quote-unquote sisterhood of churches. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you say you're controversial because you ask questions, and that's good. I have asked a lot of questions, too. That's actually why people like yourself have taken this opportunity to go through an interview because I asked questions about the Father, questions about the Son, questions about the Spirit, questions about the Trinity. And those yeah. five messages have really made an impact on a lot of people. So I, I pray you would continue to ask those questions, find answers, and share them with the conviction that God has given you from heaven because yes. he is trying to reveal truth to as many people as possible. Yes. yes. And so uh, for me, I'll tell you, uh, Daniel, just the fact that I have preached and served a ministry in which I couldn't say to my members, what are the role of angels mm -hmm. in their spiritual journey? I really had no content there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of sad. Right. 
it is kind of sad to think that God has created the, that, well, the devil um, messed up with a third and there are two thirds that remain faithful. And in my ministry, though, those two thirds have really not played a role. They, my, my, the people that were served by me were, were knew, got to know about the, the righteous, righteous by faith. They got to know about God and Trinity, but they had this preached about angels. I must, must be honest with you. Yeah. I had no message to talk about angels. Amen. Well, I, the, Lord, the Lord has given me a real burden to do that. And I've, I've got a whole playlist of about, I think it's close to 50 messages on the angels. And they, um, they're all different. I don't preach the same message over and over again. Mm. But they are very, very, very interesting to me anyways, because I never knew it either. It was something that I would just... Uh, I'd talk about like if you're about to get in a car accident, the angels would be there. But then, yes, basically it. Yes, and uh, yeah. So uh, please share those with me. I will. I'll send you a, a link. Please do share those with me. I, I I owe it to myself. Amen. So, yeah. Pastor, I want to thank you for taking this time and giving us uh, some education about your life and what you're going through. And um, you're you're inquisitive. You're wanting to learn more. May the Lord mm -hmm. bless and keep you. May your light, on behalf of what God is doing in your life, may your light shine so that people can glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And Amen. So, yeah, Amen. We're going to hopefully have you in here again where we can give an update on what's going on in your life since this. Yes, time. I'd love that. I'd love right. that. And, and I, I will be, I, I'll be following you on your newsletter. Okay. I've seen it online. Um, and um, I like the. Um, I, I actually, I, I honor you for the time where you stopped on the highway to help a lady whose car had broken down. Hey, listen. And did, and that was. I just ate with her last night. My family wonderful. gathered together. We took her out to eat and she had needed some help with her uh, finances. And she, I asked her, I said, first, you need to show me a budget. Are you using your money wisely? And sure enough, she had a budget where the last three months she was able to show me what she had been doing. And so last yes. night, we, well, I took her out to eat. We sat right there with her at a, at a restaurant. And I wrote her out a check that would help her for some of the things she's going through. God bless you, man. God bless yeah, you. It's, it's really a, an honor to be able to do those things. So Yes, yes. Thank you, brother. Yes, Thank man. You. Thank you, brother. Yes. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I followed your newsletter, your experiences in the plane, and that um, my late wife was the kind of person, here we use public transport like... Um, they call it a taxi. It's like a, probably a seven-seater. Mm -hmm. They might be, most of them are Toyota cars that move from our house to the nearest mall. And whoever she would sit with, it's a, it's probably a 30-minute trip. Yeah. She would not be quiet. She would be witnessing to that person. Amen. Me too. <laughs> and these are probably, some of them are hardened gangsters. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. And she would witness to them and look. And the, it's, it's amazing how powerful the gospel of Christ is Thank because you. this hardened gangster will be melted yes. by this very soft. My wife was a very soft spoken person. Well, one thing she had was she spoke with a baritone voice, which probably would, <laughs> I don't know whether it would uh, scare guys. I don't know. But she, <laughs> um, she would, uh, she witnessed all the time. Worse off when she was riding a longer trip, like an hour from our house to Johannesburg. That's a longer trip. Mm -hmm. She would probably bring somebody ready to baptism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was, my wife was a relentless soul winner. So I, I was, I, I supported her going to do this um, medical evangelism because uh, I had spoken to her about it. I mean, I, I didn't think she would take it on. Mm -hmm. That Ellen White promoted medical evangelism because everybody needs help. Yeah. And therefore health, like she says in many ways, is an entering way. So when you talk about somebody's health, nobody is tough enough to resist talking about their health. Right. So my wife wanted to use that training to ex to to literally evangelize our whole neighborhood. Amen. Unfortunately, by the time she finishes training, she's sick, and she's no longer able to do that, which is kind of the sad part of uh, the whole thing. But you, well, you had said she but, passed away last year, and then now mm -hmm. you have met somebody else and hopefully yes. this person will be able to help raise your two twin sons yes what a blessing yes. what a blessing i thank god for her yes 
uh, uh, where she 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 lives because we're not yet married. She doesn't live in the same place with her, with me. We are planning probably to marry in April next year. So we talk on the phone. We mostly talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. Um. So um. I I I I admire one of the beautiful things about her. Her name is Faith. Is that she is such a great um praying prayer warrior. Yeah. Praying with her here is um. I've not had elders in the church which have a clarity of um, theology around prayer as I had faith to. So I'm thankful for her and I'm thinking, you know what? And she, I mean, single-handedly as a single mother, she has raised two daughters in their, in their early 20s and they are solid girls. Hmm. So I'm thinking my children will also benefit from the kind of faith that she has. Amen. That's beautiful. Yeah, I'm just praying that God get me to be doing something that brings revenue to the family because right now I am not at a place where I'm making money uh, consistently and that is my worry. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Amen. So Amen. Now, now with this video going out, I'm sure people will become aware in your area about you and I will believe that God will call you to be preaching on this subject pretty soon. And so that would be, that'll be an honor. May the, Lord, may the Lord provide for you during this time. Brother, I, I will actually, I'll be getting in touch with you, giving you another, um, a pastor who was interested. Okay. Uh, he's older than me, mm -hmm. whom, who, who wanted to uh, actually watch the videos as well. Okay. So I told him I'll link him with you. Yes. His name, his name is Tula. Okay. Tula means peace. Oh, well, good. I hope he's peaceful. Brother, I would you want to... Would you mind praying for us to close? I appreciate that. Well, no, why not? No, I would love to pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to interview with Pastor Daniel Mesa. I thank you, Lord, for his ministry. I thank you for his global outreach. I thank you, Lord, for the burden you have placed on his heart. I do not know his wife personally, but I thank you, Lord, for giving him a wife that stands in support. One of the biggest challenges in life is marrying the wrong person. I thank you, Lord, that you've given him a wife that is able to be supportive of his ministry because I can almost be sure that if she was not supportive, he wouldn't have come this far. So bless her, Lord, give her added wisdom that she might actually keep um, uh, raising him up like the, the people of old who raised the hands of Moses when wars were going on. But Daniel Mesa is fighting a serious war where the name of God is at stake and the devil is playing with it, saying things that make heathens laugh and, um, and, and deride your glory and your goodness. Almost reminds me of Psalms chapter 2, why the heathens rage and, and imagine a vain thing. Lord, we are embarrassed as Christians that we have led the world imagine vain things about you. As we seek to restore your dignity in a world that the devil has tried to make a, you a joke of. Give us strength, give us wisdom, give us agility, give us speed to do things in a manner that glorifies you. Uh, bless uh, Pastor Mesa in a very important way. Increase his wisdom, increase your revelation in, in his life and help him, Lord, to serve you in a way that will continue to glorify you so that one day when all the work on earth has been done and you are coming, like your word says, to seek the work of your hands, with earnest, to earnestly seek the, the work of your hands. We pray that, Lord, we might have been found faithful. This is our prayer this afternoon. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen.